a pop up and then we'll share the results of. And now I wanted to introduce our instructor for today. So Scott Pipkin is the Director of Education and Engagement at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. He was born and raised in San Diego. He received a degree in geography with an emphasis in biogeography from UCLA. He has spent his career acquiring and sharing an understanding of the natural world that emphasizes the interconnections that surround us. These efforts have allowed him to work in some of the most beautiful and ecologically rich places in the Southwest, which includes Yosemite, the redwoods of the San Mateo coast, Tejon Ranch, Saguaro National Park in Arizona, and the Lincoln National Forest in New Mexico. Along the way, he received a degree in landscape architecture from the University of Arizona and spent countless hours identifying plants, birds, butterflies, and anything else that has come his way. Welcome, Scott. Thanks so much. Uh, really glad to be here today and talking about some of our WaterWise California native plants. Uh, as Madeline said, I am the Director of Education and Engagement at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. I've been in this role since uh, September of 2018, so it's been kind of a, a wild couple years for me and um, really excited that we've been utilizing these virtual um, means to present some of this information. So um, I guess without any further ado, let's get into it because we got a lot to talk about. So next slide, please. So what are we going to talk about? First, I'd, I'd like to just, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the garden and who we are and what makes us a, a special place. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about planning your garden and preparing uh, for installing these water-wise California native plants, a little bit about maintaining them. And then we'll, we'll get really into the meat of it, which is um, some of our favorite um, high-performance California water-wise native plants. And then we'll have some question and answer time. So that's, that's the outlook of the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Next slide, please. So um, the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden is a, a pretty special location. I'm really pleased to be working here and, and very proud of uh, what we represent. So we are uh, one of, if not the oldest botanic garden dedicated solely to the native plants of a region. Uh, there's the, um, oh, what's the one? on the East Coast, I, does, I guess it doesn't much matter, but we were founded around the same time as, as them and also the what's now the California Botanic Garden, Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, uh, but pretty forward thinking group of folks in the, the middle of the 1920s. Um, the original idea was to have a garden that extended from the San Ynez Mountains all the way down to the coast and there would be a driving tour and you'd see all of these habitats of uh, the Western United States. But quickly, the founders realized um, how prohibitively expensive that would be. And uh, so we were gifted this parcel here by Anna Dorinda Blakesley Bliss. Um, and now today we are um, a major force in California. We are dedicated to horticulture. So we, inter we have introduced about 35 uh, cultivars and selections to the, the trade. Um, we also do a lot of conservation and research. We have a seed bank. We have a regionally significant herbarium of uh, dried plant specimens. And of course, we have our um, education programs. Um, so we can, um, next slide, please. So um, before we get into this, I'd just like to get to know a little bit more about uh, who we have in the audience. And we're just curious, uh, what, what are some of your garden goals? So Madeline's put up some uh, choices for you. You know, you, you may have many of these are your goals, but if you could just pick a top priority, um, give you about a minute to do so. And as we'll discuss in a moment, goal setting is, is really the first step um, 
before we can have a design we're pleased with, we have to know what a pleasing design means to us. Okay, great. So we're seeing a lot of folks uh, identifying the, the outdoor living space. So this kind of indoor outdoor thing, that's one of the reasons we live where we live, right? So we can be outside for 300, 320 days of the year if we desire. Really happy to see wildlife habitat in there so we can talk a little bit about some of the, the qualities that make good wildlife habitat. Um, curb appeal and then screening and privacy. Okay, great. So that, that really helps. I'll try to um, make sure this talk is directed towards those goals. Thanks for sharing everyone. And we can go to the next slide, please. So um, real quick, you know, why are we emphasizing native plants? Um, and there are a few reasons, right? We're in California, so shouldn't our landscapes reflect our place? Um, California is one of five Mediterranean regions in the world. Uh, Mediterranean climate regions are among the most biodiverse and uh, especially floristically impressive. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, the Mediterranean regions of the world were identified as a biodiversity hotspot. So extremely high endemism, so high occurrence of plants in California that occur nowhere else in the world, and high threat. Uh, because obviously we have a lot of development in California and, and other issues, invasive species, uh, climate change. Uh, of course, you know, the, the main conceit of this talk is water-wise, right? Water conservation. These plants are adapted to our Mediterranean climate, which means we have a drought every single year. Every year we get an annual drought from about now all the way until, if we're lucky, October might need to wait till November. And so planting plants that are adapted to this climate uh, is really a smart choice. It lowers our water bill, it lowers the uh, pressure that we put on our freshwater resources, and it, um, it doesn't guarantee success, but have a higher likelihood of success, um, particularly in some of our more extreme climates. If you live more inland, where it's perhaps more arid and, and the summertime gets that much hotter uh, and you want to be low water use, choosing native is a, is a good way to go. And then finally, the primary reason we talk about at the garden is the habitat value. Um, so I, I think if, if you advance Madeline, uh, a photo will pop up. Um, so yeah, I mean, you've, we've got this Townsend's warbler here that's got that insect in its mouth. And um, so obviously some, some wildlife are going to be eating the seeds and living in these plants as their shelter. But um, there is this really tight relationship between plants and insects. And so um, insects represent the, as a group, they are the most biodiverse group. In terms of biomass, um, insects are the most abundant animals, pretty much. And almost half of those insects are herbivores. The vast majority of those herbivores have specific larval host plants that they require. So uh, a very common one we think about these days is monarch and milkweed. If there is no milkweed, there is no monarch. A lot of insects have those relationships. Of course, it's the lepidopterans, the butterflies and moths, but we also have a number of other types of insects that have these host plant relationships with native plants. And so if we think about an ecosystem as a pyramid of energy, the base of that pyramid is going to be our plants. The next level up is the insects, and then everything else flows from there. So if we want the wildlife, if we want our California native animals, if we want our native California ecosystems, it starts with California native plants, and then the next level up is going to be those invertebrates and those insects. And then, you know, right now, all these breeding birds, even if they're um, seed eaters, uh, like sparrows and finches and things like that most of the year, right now they're insectivores. And that's what they're feeding their young as they're breeding. 96% um, of terrestrial songbirds feed their young a diet that consists 100% of insects. Native plants bring those native insects, which are the food for our native birds, mammals, and all of the other wildlife. Next slide, please. So let's, let's think now, you know, hopefully I've convinced you why we want to utilize native plants. 
Uh, and so now that you're convinced, let's think about how are we going to apply, uh, how are we going to apply this and utilize some of these plants? And it, it starts with setting some goals. Um, we talked a little bit about a lot of you are interested in outdoor living spaces. Um, so now we can start to ask ourselves questions. Well, what makes a good outdoor living space? Is it uh, a little bit of shade relief from the sun during the summertime, those long, hot summer nights uh, where the sun stays up until 9 p.m.? We want to give ourselves some release re so that we can um, have a meal outdoors. Is it about um, enhancing views that we might already have? Um, does the project dovetail with other home improvement projects you're doing? Maybe you're considering uh, a gray water on your laundry to landscape uh, sort of deal there. And that will influence what your planting design is and water availability and location of plants and things like that. Um, and then the next step, so step one is really thinking about, well, what do you want? What do you need? How does this fit in with your, your domicile, your plans for your, your living space? And then we think about what are your site conditions? Are you really close to the coast and you're gonna have a lot of salty, foggy air? You want to consider plants that can tolerate that extreme maritime environment, which actually has a lot of salt precipitating in the air. And a number of our plants are pretty sensitive to that. Um, similarly, if you're inland, uh, you wanna make sure you're, you're getting plants that can tolerate the more arid environment where you're gonna have sunnier days. Um, what about the sun patterns on your property? Where, where are the shadows and when? How does that change over the course of the year? So you're making sure to put the right plant in the right place. And one thing I really encourage you to do, and we have some images here, do some sketching. Um, even if you don't consider yourself an artist, these aren't works of art. This, this isn't uh, for you to display in a gallery. This is about process. And this is about understanding spatial relationships. So you see that image at the bottom, that cross-sectional diagram. There's so much information conveyed in that diagram that can really help you plan your uh, planting design and your selection of plants and understand what it's going to look like in space. Okay, if I put that shrub right there as a foundation planting next to that staircase, how is that going to interact with my trees that I already have? How might that look? So I really encourage you get into plan view. So that's the above view, the Google Earth view. Um, and you can use things like Google Maps to print off, get some um, tracing paper, try to print out some of these uh, aerial views, work in plan and also work in this cross-sectional. Um, so thinking about what your slope is how, um, where you have drainages, where you have changes of grade, and how you might design for those spaces. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, once once you kind of get your your goals and your biotic and abiotic inventory, this is where it for me it really starts to get a little more fun, and we we can think about um, well, we want to create habitat. So, in some ways, that's mimicking natural systems but these are our yards. And so we get to sort of dictate what grows there. And here we have uh, five elements of design and you know, there you can kind of slice this a number of ways. Different people have seven elements of design, nine. I chose five um, and, and here they are. So starting from the left, unity and variety. So this is really gonna help as we start to think about the plant materials like our massing. So something like a hookara, the coral bells, it's a really diminutive plant. If we use just one of those, it's probably going to get lost in amongst the other plantings. So that's something that we wanna create a mass of. Variety is great. Um, a, ecosystems tend to be diverse. You, you don't often see functioning ecosystems that are completely dominated entirely by one species. So we want that variety, but we have to be careful about this kind of hodgepodgey one of everything. Um, visually, it's not as appealing. And also if we're really thinking about trying to create habitat, that one hookara isn't going to do much. Uh, maybe it's going to provide a, some pollen for a, a couple of bees, but it's not really gonna support populations of, of these insects and uh, other organisms that we want to bring in as habitat. Scale and proportion, of course, make sure you don't put 
smaller plants behind big ones because you're not going to see them. Um, just like we saw in that cross-sectional diagram on the previous slide, how, does, how do we wanna create foundation plantings at the base of some of our taller plantings and really highlight that scale and proportion? Um, rhythm, that's more of a, a plant selection. There are some really rhythmic plants in our uh, flora that we can choose from that give us just this um, nice sense of movement when we're looking. Um, emphasis, these are your uh, kind of showstopper plants. These are the plants that maybe during this time of year are going to be loaded with blooms or wonderful fruits or pollinators. Uh, these are plants, consider container plants. Uh, really great emphasis in that container plant. You have a specimen plant uh, growing out of a container, perhaps a Dudleya or something like that, that might get lost uh, in amongst some of your other plantings. But when you have it in that pot, uh, it really pops. And then uh, of course, balance. Oftentimes when we think of balance, we think of like a symmetrical balance, uh, but I encourage you to think about other kinds of balance. So radial balance, uh, but also this idea of asymmetrical balance. And I think um, if that intrigues you, I encourage you to look into uh, like Japanese garden design, uh, particularly some of the Zen rock gardens, which are very much based on these principles of asymmetrical balance. It's about these triangles that you're forming that are really visually appealing one of the beauties of that style of design too is you're thinking about how does the design change as you move through the space. So if I have a, a you know a triangle shape, from one angle it might look like you know an isosceles triangle, but from another angle it might look more like an equilateral triangle, and you get this kind of interesting interplay between the plants as you're moving through the space. So that adds dynamism and interest to your design as an observer of the landscape. Next slide, please. So just a couple notes. Uh, I, you know, I will freely admit here, I'm not a horticulturalist. So some of these slides are, are not my highest. You helped me out with some of these slides, but just some rules of thumb when you're looking at plants. Um, it is okay to, um, it's sort of, Joe explained to me, it's sort of like picking produce. Um, you don't want to, you know, squeeze your avocados to oblivion, but it's okay to kind of handle the plant a little bit, maybe see what that root ball is looking like uh, gently, as long as you're pretty certain you're not going to damage the plant. Make sure it's not too root bound. Um, and then, you know, fall is really what we consider our planting season. So it, it really coincides with our uh, rainy season. So that kind of mid-October, um, we the insulation goes down, the sun angle is really shifting, we're in that fall equinox, much higher likelihood that it's going to start raining and nourishing those plants. So right now is probably not the best time to plant, although it can be done. Um, you might want to, you know, this is a great time to plan your garden spring and summer so that you have your shopping list ready in the fall. Next slide, please. So when you are planting your plants, um, you, you want to make sure one thing with, with our native plants is we're not burying them too deep. We want that root collar where the, um, the soil goes to in the nursery pot uh, to be pretty much level with, if not very slightly above the ground. So you're not a super deep hole, but you want to make it nice and wide because you want to uh, aerate all of that soil that hopefully those roots will be going into. Um, you also want to um, make sure you're not pounding and compacting the soil when you backfill your hole. So just gently keep it fluffy because the roots want to push through that nice fluffy nutrient rich soil. Uh, we don't want water pooling on top. We want it to infiltrate down into the root zone and then uh, really soaking it in uh, when, you, when you first plant it and soak a large area. Uh, we're not watering the leaves of these plants. We want to water the root zone. The, the roots are what need the water. Occasionally, you know, a little bit of mist can re reduce evapotranspiration in the, the leaves, but it's important to remember we're watering the root zone of the plant. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, mulch is, is a great idea. Uh, be careful about the mulch touching the stem because that becomes a vector for pathogens fungus and bacteria, which can then uh, infect your plants. And that's, that's true of most plants, um, especially like fruit trees. If you're doing uh, compost donuts right now, giving your fruit trees a little extra nutrient, make sure that compost is you know about six inches from the base of your plant. So it's kind of a donut around the plant uh, so that you're not getting any pathogens on the, the plant material itself. Um, you know, we say water wise, we also want these plants to be successful. So supplemental water for the first year or so while the plant gets established is, is probably going to be um, necessary for a lot of these plants. So just beware, yeah, I planted a water-wise native plant. I put it in, I soaked it deeply, I never have to water it again. Isn't necessarily um, the, the most appropriate logic to apply. So we want to take good care of these plants while they're getting established, and then we can really dial back the watering as they get established. Next slide, please. And, you know, finally, and this is part of your, your goal setting too, is think about what kind of maintenance you really are prepared for. Is this something that you're going to hire somebody to help you out with? Is this something you want to do yourself? What can you tolerate? yourself and really try to be realistic about that on the front end. Um, because if you if you install a lot of plants that re require a lot of maintenance and you're not up for the task, very quickly your um, beautiful design can, can look rangy and overgrown and perhaps not as appealing as you'd like it to be. That actually makes for great habitat. So again, that kind of goal goes back to your goals. Um, but thinking about the curb appeal and what are your neighbors going to say, are you in an HOA? Do you have to maintain your plants to some degree? Um, what are you going to tolerate? So um, really thinking about the, the future of the maintenance is pretty important. And just remember when you install your plants, for the most part, you're going to be purchasing four inch pots and one gallon pots. Those are little babies. They're really going to fill in. So when you're planning, you should really look at the the size the plant goes to. And one, one thing you can do when planning is estimate about 75% of that size. And that should be what you're spacing, what you're planning for uh, when you're designing your garden. Next slide, please. So uh, now we've got another poll question. And yeah, so you can see here, we have uh, six choices. Um, again, I, I imagine you're looking for many of these types of plants, but uh, what, what are you most in search of? Are you looking to build a canopy? Are you looking to fill in your shrub layer? Are you looking for more of a ground cover layer? Curious to see what y'all are looking for. All right, so we're looking for some of the smaller stuff. So when we get into the plants, we're gonna start from the canopy and go down, uh, just FYI. But it seems like y'all are, are more interested in um, our diminutive plants, which is great. That's awesome. Getting that ground plane taken care of, the small shrubs, really critical habitat uh, for, for a lot of a lot of critters there, but that is one consideration uh, with some of our smaller shrubs is location of those plants because they're gonna create that dense foliage, that nice um, shelter for a lot of organisms, including rodents at times. So are you placing those right next to your house? Are you placing those a little bit away from the house? Being strategic about where you're creating that habitat and what the, the outcomes might be if the animals do come to that space is that going to create a maintenance problem for you? Every time you step out the door, you're worried that there's a critter in the shrub that you planted 
right on the foundation of your home. So just one uh, goal setting and maintenance consideration moving forward. Um, next slide, please. So let's, let's get into it. Um, I'm gonna run through these plants, next slide. And we'll start, like I said, from the, the canopy down. So this is one of my favorites, the Catalina cherry. Um, this is prunus, so it's related to apples, cherries, peaches, uh, all those great fruit plants. The fruit isn't terribly, um, I mean, it's, it's edible, um, but it's not um, super delicious, I guess. And it's mostly seed. Uh, but it can be a pretty large tree for you. I have one right outside of my office. Great habitat for birds, uh, particularly in the summer when those fruits are going on. And actually right now in the spring, uh, great pollinator habitat, the flowers, really lovely. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have the Santa Cruz Island ironwood. This is uh, a living fossil. There are fossils of this plant from 13 million years ago in the Miocene area, era that were found in Nevada. Um, so this is uh, a plant that ended up on the islands and was able to survive because it got isolated. Uh, really unique member of the rose family again. Um, beautiful vertical sort of form. They, they do re-sprout from the stem um, and it can be pruned back pretty, pretty intensely. And as a, its origins are on the island, so a little bit more of that maritime, a lot of fog, and you can uh, water it a little bit in the summertime. Next slide, please. Love the red buds. I mean, look at that. Uh, member of the pea family. So that means uh, it is uh, a nitrogen fixer. So of course, nitrogen is the most abundant element in our atmosphere. It makes up about 70% of our atmosphere. It's critical for a lot of biological function, but uh, most organisms, it's not bioavailable. Bio they can't just take the nitrogen from the atmosphere and, and utilize it. So there has to be an intermediary and um, members of the pea family have a relationship with bacteria that can fix the nitrogen from the atmosphere and add it to the soil. So it's kind of a nice plant in that way. Really lovely, you can prune it as a single stem, you can make it more of a fountain, uh, multi-stem, got these lovely, lovely flowers uh, pretty early in the season, February, uh, early March, which create nice pea pods and really interesting foliage. Um, so this, this is a great one. Fairly small uh, tree, unless it's uh, pretty old. Next slide, please. Getting into our shrubs now. Next slide, yep. Uh, we've got Ceanothus ray Hartman. This is one of the tried and true um, Ceanothus cultivars. So this is a, a cross between Ceanothus arboreus, so that's the island Ceanothus, which is more of a tree-like uh, Ceanothus and uh, Griseus. Uh, they are nitrogen fixers as well, all members of the Ceanothus uh, group. So that's kind of kind of a cool thing. There's an added uh, habitat benefit underground. Um, and these it has look at those big leaves. Ceanothus tend to have pretty small leaves that, that are filled with terpenes, which are a, a secondary chemical that plants produce to reduce herbivory. So if you went hiking in the hills and found a Ceanothus macrocarpus or Ceanothus spinosus and plucked a leaf and put it against your tongue, it would be really acrid and astringent and it would probably make your tongue go numb uh, for a minute or two. These leaves don't do that. So the deer can really hammer um, these plants. So it's something that you might want to consider a little bit if you have a lot of deer in your yard. Next slide, please. Love this heteromeles, another member of the rose family. Um, you know, there, there are those stories about uh, Hollywood land being named for all the toy on in the, the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, it's a, an iconic chaparral plant. Um, so really, really love the fruits on this plant. One of the nice things is as your goal setting, think about your seasonality. So a plant like this can extend our season where it's giving us fall and winter fruits. So now we're providing habitat for some of our frugivorous birds like our cedar waxwings and our thrushes and um, other you know, kind of vagrant birds that you might not expect, but they might get attracted to uh, resources like winter fruits. Next slide, please. 
the Rus, gotta love the Rus. These are our members of the Anacardiaceae family. So they are relatives of poison oak. Um, so that is something to be aware of. If you're really sensitive to poison oak, things like the Rus, melasma, the laurel sumac, uh, be careful with those uh, because I, I know folks that, that are extremely sensitive to poison oak and they, they have had reactions to some of these plants, especially when pruning. Um, they take a hard pruning. We have a, in the courtyard of the garden, there is a, a hedge, a small hedge that's been pruned uh, like a boxwood for about 90 years. Um, really great. And then close cousin is sugar bush. You can see with those more taco shaped leaves on the left, um, that's more of an inland plant. Uh, really love this one, great habitat. Uh, it's got a lot of great qualities to it. Next slide, please. Uh, gotta love the Arctostaphylos. They, they can be a little bit tricky sometimes. So something like a Howard McMinn is a pretty tried and true uh, member of the genus. Um, you can see in that image on the left, it just has that, that lovely form with the beautiful red bark. And then in the um, late winter, early spring, you're going to have those urn-like um, flowers that are indicative of the Ericaceae, the Heath family. So uh, relative of blueberries, um, which is kind of cool. They're also buzz pollinated. So um, bumblebees tend to be the pollinators of these and they actually vibrate at a certain frequency to um, target the release of the pollen, which is kind of a neat phenomenon to watch. So if you, if you look, you'll see honeybees all over these plants, but look at their legs. They're not gonna have a lot of pollen packed on the legs because they can't figure it out. Uh, whereas the bumblebees are just gonna be chock full of pollen. So great plant for our native pollinators. Next slide, please. I'd say this is kind of my favorite in a lot of ways. Uh, I love mountain mahogany. It's a, a plant that you can find all throughout the Southwest. Uh, another member of the rose family. Look at those beautiful fruits it develops. It has pretty inconspicuous little flowers. It's flowering right now, um, but it's, it's a, a great plant. It can grow vertically. So similar to the ironwood, good for those narrow spaces. It grows pretty quickly. It can make a good screen. It can make a dense hedge. A uh, lot of pollinators really like this plant. A lot of insects use it as a, a larval host plant. So for me, in terms of habitat and in terms of its utility in the landscape, this is a, a big bang for your buck kind of plant. And it, and it can be shaped, it can be pruned. Next slide, please. Another, another favorite, uh, the Frangula coffee berry, uh, sort of a nondescript plant, but evergreen foliage. Um, it's in Ramnaceae. It's a, a cousin of the Ceanothus. I don't think it's a nitrogen fixer, um, but it has really nice fruits that sort of start out yellowy and then they turn red and then they turn to uh, a deep kind of purple blackish color, uh, fairly nondescript cryptic little flowers, but the pollinators love it. And uh, from some anecdotal evidence, it seems like coffee berry is a great plant for beneficial insects. So not necessarily larval host plant, but things like our praying mantids, uh, things like our ladybugs, things like our, our lacewings, which are going to be eating aphids and eating pests, seem to like the, um, the frangula quite a bit. Next slide, please. So now we're, we're getting down um, into slightly smaller. Um, so this is more of a three foot high by a 12 foot wide spread. Uh, this is the Joyce Coulter Ceanothus. Uh, it can take a, a harder pruning. Uh, it has sort of that creeping or weeping growth form, which you can really use architecturally, uh, but also on steep slopes for a little bit of stability and massing on that slope where it can be a little more difficult to plant a lot of plants. You don't want to be uh, hoofing it up and down the slope to plant things that creates compaction. So you want more of a spreading plant on those slopes. This is a good choice. Next slide, please. Uh, this is very similar application, uh, the Canyon Gray Sage. Um, one cool thing, if, if you're looking at California native plants and you see that name canyon in single quotes, that's a cultivar or a selection, that typically means that the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden introduced it. So that's kind of cool. Um, this is the more prostrate selection 
of uh, Artemisia californica, sometimes called coast sagebrush or uh, cowboy cologne, very aromatic. Those are those terpenes, that secondary chemistry um, to reduce herbivory. One thing to know about this plant and some of our other um, kind of quote unquote softer chaparral plants or coastal chaparral plants like our salvias, our artemisia, they can be drought deciduous. As I mentioned before, we've, we've got this Mediterranean climate that guarantees a drought every year. And by the end of that drought, one strategy some of our plants have to deal with it is rather than maintain those green leaves that whenever the sun's hitting them, they're doing photosynthesis, which means they're losing water. If there's no input of water that can create a lot of stress on the plant, so they just lose their leaves. It's kind of similar to our winter deciduous plants back east where that winter time, there really isn't a lot of liquid water available. Um, if the plant leaves the leaves on, it's highly likely that they're gonna freeze, they're gonna get damaged. And so it makes more sense for the plant to just lose the leaves for the season, lose that vector of uh, potential water loss and tissue damage and regrow them in the spring. Same idea here with these plants where they're losing the leaves in the, in the late summer. So around August, September, they might look a little bit sad for you. So just know that. Next slide, please. Uh, love this pigeon point coyote brush. Coyote brush is a great plant. Uh, it's tough. It's great for a lot of applications. This pigeon point variety, uh, pigeon points a location on the central coast uh, in between Santa Cruz and Half Moon Bay. If you've never been, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, beautiful spot, great tide pooling. And this is, uh, it's right on the coast. So more prostrate form from all of the wind. Um, and uh, it's dioecious. So two houses, that means you're going to have a staminate plant. So a plant that has the pollen and a pistillate plant, a plant that makes the fruits. Um, so just consider that um, the staminate plant's going to attract more of the pollinators. The pistillate plant's going to attract different kinds of uh, organisms because it doesn't have the pollen. Uh, you might want to get a couple of them if you want seeds and perhaps uh, reproduction. Uh, it can get a little rangy, so this is one that um, you might want to consider pruning or, you know, choose this pigeon point cultivar because it's a little more compact and creeping. And especially given what people have indicated about uh, their desire for plants, the pigeon point might fit visually the kind of uh, plants you're looking for. Next slide, please. This is a, this is a favorite uh, in the garden, this Catalina current. Um, it's got huge glands on the underside that if, if you rub them, even if you rub against them, it's, it's kind of this uh, citrusy, piney sort of scent, really nice. Uh, the berries are, are pretty uh, popular. You know, this whole genus Ribes, there are tons of great plants. So look into the, the gooseberries and the currants. Gooseberries are going to be spiny, so they're going to tend to have spines on the, the growth nodes and the fruit's going to be spiny, whereas a current is going to be more smooth barked and have smoother fruits. So just, just note um, some of those differences. The flowers look a little bit different. The currants tend to have more tubular flowers, whereas the gooseberries have uh, more reflexed sepals and then the floral parts kind of extend beyond. So maybe do a little bit of research in some of the other ribes that are available, but the Catalina currants are great performer, uh, fits the bill for a lot of what you all are asking for as well, and good uh, sensory plant with the aromatics. Next slide, please. Sorry, Scott, I'm getting this spinning wheel on my computer. <laughs> no worries. Well, I can take a sec. Uh, maybe I'll get into some of these questions. I see a bunch in the Q&A. Um, I see a question about flannel bush. Um, planting flannel bush in a water-wise garden. I mean, they're great once they get established. They can be finicky little plants. Um, they can be hard to establish. It's one of the ones that we found people have a hard time with. I think um, people tend to overwater it. Uh, people maybe tend to put it in heavier soils. We tend to have more clay soils around here. This is a plant that I think prefers um, the uh, more well-drained soils. Catalina current, it, it takes a lot of exposures actually, um, but it, it does pretty well on a more um, 
protected, I've noticed some of our northern exposures, it does particularly well at. Um, it'll probably be a little bit, um, the color will be a little bit nicer in a little bit of uh, shade. So yeah, um, going back to flannel bush, I think it's a great plant. It depends on your application. If you're, if you're putting it um, in a place where you're going to be walking by it and brushing it and interacting with a lot, yeah, it might be a little bit irritating to you. But if you're putting it in the back of your design as a, a, an anchor to the back part of your planting design, and it's more of a visual type of plant, it, it might be great. I think the trouble there is just going to be getting it established and getting it to survive. Um, but once it's established, it's a killer plant, I think, and just gorgeous flowers. Um, design fundamentals, how to keep water on site. There, there are a ton of uh, resources for that. I think, you know, passive water harvesting. So really thinking about your, your basins uh, and your bioswales, thinking about where your high points and your low points are, where is water going to be moving? If you know you've got a low point, can you uh, create a mulch basin there and put plantings in that mulch basin where it's going to collect a lot of that water so you keep it on site? I know Sweetwater has a great relationship with the city and they have a ton of resources about water harvesting. And there's also a series of books uh, by Brad Lancaster, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands, Volumes 1 through 3. Um, highly recommend those books, great diagrams. And I think he has a website, I think it's harvestingrainwater.com or .org, Brad Lancaster out of Tucson, uh, great resource for rainwater harvesting. Um, Amendments for native plants, yeah, they, they love compost, sure. Uh, a little bit of compost never, never hurts, a little extra nutrients. And again, remember if you're doing, um, yeah, Brad Lancaster, he's, he's a great speaker, the, the YouTube stuff, um, yeah, some great videos. Um, the, the compost, if you're sort of top dressing, just consider again, making that donut with it. Um, Cedar shavings for mulch. Uh, I actually don't have a ton of experience with cedar shavings. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts about that. Um, I would say, you know, it's it's probably pretty good. I think for a lot of our native plants, they're they're not as used to um, the the conifers as being the overstory uh, for a lot, especially in our region. There's going to be more of an oak overstory. So if you can get yourself more of an oak leaf mulch or something like that. Um, mixed mulch that has a variety of things. You might get some seeds in there, but the county provides uh, free mulch, I believe, and, and that can be a source as well. But um, you might try the cedar shavings. I mean, one thing, I don't know, you, you could potentially like soak the, the shavings just in case they have any sort of allelopathy or anything like that, that kind of inhibits other growth and try to leach some of that out and then spread it out. Um, the garden nursery is open. Yeah, come on by, uh, 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Good plants for pots in deep shade. Let me think about that uh, for a moment. Um, small trees as a screen for my neighbors. Um, you might try the mountain mahogany for that application. It might, if you're a second story, it might take a few years to grow up that high, it might not quite get that high. You know, if you're, if you're like 15, 20 feet up, you're, you're really looking more at a canopy. So more of a tree type plant. So it might be tough. Uh, maybe the ironwood in that narrow space gets you a lot of vertical. It might not be as dense to create the screen as you might like, um, but it can be sort of your foundation of that screen and maybe uh, interplanting the mountain mahogany with the ironwood can get can get that fullness and then you'll get both the height and the the dense screen. Would I recommend bay trees? Bay trees are great. Um, you know, here in the garden there, we joke they're a little bit weedy, especially after the fire. Um, I think it's a great plant. Sure. Uh, recommend bay trees if that's your, your cup of tea. Um, what I might do now is continue in with the slides so we get through all of them and then we'll return to the questions. Thanks, Madeline, for pulling that up. Uh, and we can go to the next, next slide, please. Uh, Ariognum fasciculatum, the flat top buckwheat, California buckwheat, this is great. Uh, it's got these uh, umbels of cream colored flowers that it puts up. It, it flowers profusely, pollinators love it. It's a larval host plant for a number of butterflies. 
And uh, in the late summer, fall, those flower clusters get pollinated, they turn to seeds, and then they have this really nice coppery cover color, which can be great food for the seed eaters. So um, with some of these plants, if you're really trying to get habitat value, consider holding off on your deadheading uh, for a little while to, to let the, the goldfinches and the finches eat those seeds. Next slide, please. Love the ashy leaf buckwheat. So if you're just looking for more of a broad leaf, uh, it's got a little bit more of an emphatic foliage and a little more of a um, impressive flower color. And then that coppery umbel of seeds, uh, I think is, is an even more beautiful, it's more of a cinnamon cinnamony color than the kind of deep brown of the Ariognum fasciculatum. Um, Ariognum is a great genus for us. And I think we have a couple more that we'll be talking about in a moment. Next slide. Um, the salvias are great. You, you know, there are tons of salvias in California, but here's a nice low plant, the bees bliss at the, as the name implies, a lot of native bees really like this one. Um, it's a, it's a lower growing, more compact sort of plant. Um, you can give it an occasional deep watering and that might minimize your drought deciduousness. It's also going to depend on the environment. But as I mentioned before, salvias uh, tend to be drought deciduous, especially I would presume in a year like this, when we get so little precipitation and it looks like we're setting up for, um, we'll see if, if May gray or June gloom happen, but a lot of insulation on these plants. So high uh, evapotranspiration rates, which is going to stress that plant and make it more likely to go deciduous during the, um, the summertime. Next slide, please. In Celia Californica, I, I think the flowers speak for themselves. Uh, you see the, the growth form, it can be a little bit rangy. This is also short-lived. So think of it as maybe a successional plant. Uh, perhaps it will reseed, but when plants reseed, they don't always go where you want them. Uh, and it may not survive for more than a few years. So uh, fill that space while you plan some future plantings or while some other plants fill in more of your slow growing plants, a great, a great choice for that. Next slide, please. Yankee Point Ceanothus. This is uh, an even more extreme creeper. Um, high performance. This is, this is a, a perennial favorite. And um, so like I was saying, you, you might want to think about plants that tolerate salt spray. This is one that I know tolerates um, those salty, the, the sea air. Um, so great plant. And on all Ceanothus, those flower heads uh, are soap. So you can collect the flowers and put a little water and rub your hands together and you'll notice it lathers up and it is actually a, a surfactant. It is going to, to clean your hands a little bit, which is kind of cool. Next slide, please. So getting through it, I'm gonna to try to go quickly. I know we're running against time here. Epilobium canum, California fuchsia, got that light gray foliage, beautiful. Um, late spring, all the way to fall, it can bloom. Uh, it can be a spreader, which is nice. Uh, it's great in a container if you want. Um, it can be deciduous in, in the winter time or it can go drought deciduous. So that's one thing to know with this plant. It can be um, a little bit, I don't wanna say unattractive, but it's not going to look as luscious as some of our other plants all throughout the year, depending on environmental conditions. Next slide, please. Hummingbird sage, Salvia spathacea, another one of our favorites. Um, it does get a little bit drought deciduous. It's got those beautiful flowers, uh, really impressive, great fragrance. And uh, the Avis Keaty selection is a kind of a light cream color. I don't know how available it is in the nursery trade, but um, it, can, it can be great kind of interplanted with the red. Um, so you get both the, the yellow cream color and the red flowers, which is visually kind of appealing. And they do spread rhizomally. So not necessarily through seed, but through the roots. Next slide, please. Another areogonum, uh, look at those exerted inflorescences, really cool. So this one grows from more of a basal rosette. Um, so you've got a cluster of leaves toward the base of the plant, and then you've got the exerted uh, inflorescence, which is really quite lovely. Um, and it can reseed. 
um, just a high performing plant. And those flowers are just show stopping. This is a great plant to mass. As you see here, putting a bunch of them on a border or a bunch of them at the base of a, another kind of plant that you want for some emphasis, um, Ariogonum grande rubescens, great choice for that. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, you've got your hookahs. You know, this is one that can really get lost if you're not massing them appro appropriately. So that unity and variety, uh, putting a lot of these together. I mean, if you come to the garden right now, you'll see they're just going off. And we have these mass plantings of hookah that are just, you know, pink, red, white, all over the ground. Um, tons of cultivars of this plant. And the cultivars give you a variety of flower colors and leaf size, which is kind of nice. If you go with like the island alum root, um, you're getting really big leaves. And there are some really small, like the, the coral bells is more of a diminutive leaf with a really bright red flower. So lots of choices in the hookahs. Next slide, please. Uh, Budalua gracilis, this is a, a great perennial bunch grass ground cover that tolerates uh, walk-on. So if you're thinking about replacing some sort of lawn, uh, this can be a great choice for you. Um, really cool uh, seed heads. They kind of look like eyelashes. So if you let it uh, go all the way to seed, um, you have these kind of architectural structures um, that you can have. It also can, can be mowed. Um, so if you, if you don't want it to go to seed, then you can just mow it down. Next, please. Similarly, uh, this carex looks like a grass, um, but it, it's not. It's a sedge. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a more of a cooler season plant, so it's growing more in the winter and spring uh, when we're getting our, our rain. Um, it does pretty well with foot traffic. If you want to see examples of both the Budalua and this um, carex, you can come either to our Waterwise Home Garden. The um, north side of the Waterwise Home Garden has Carex. The south side has Budalua. Or at our Pritzloff Conservation Center, we have three lawns. We have a Budalua lawn. We have an Akalea lawn. So that's a Yarrow lawn and a Carex lawn. And those lawns get a lot of foot traffic. So you can see what they do with uh, moderate to heavy foot traffic if you come to our garden and see how they perform under those conditions. Next slide, please. Those are all of the plants I was planning on sharing today. Uh, I've got some, some great folks that I owe a lot to uh, helping me develop this. So many thanks to them. And uh, next slide, I believe we have some resources for you. So uh, our, our website has a ton of information. Uh, the California Native Plant Society manages something called calscape.org, which is really a wonderful resource. Uh, and there are some books that are available for you. Um, so, you know, please be in touch and um, yeah, check us out here at the garden. So Scott, can you hold up our booklet as well? Oh, and yeah, of course. Sorry. Yeah, we've got the Waterwise Native Plants for Santa Barbara County that uh, the garden helped develop. And actually, if it's all right, I can share a link to that uh, in the chat box. Yeah, that would be great. So this, um, this booklet's really handy. It's similar to the presentation, a lot of the same plants you'll find in both, um, but it follows the same categories of uh, large trees, small trees, shrubs, ground covers, etc. cetera. Um, and that's a great resource. It'll refer to all the plants that were referred to today and um, additional plants. So we have a lot of questions, Scott, but I have yeah. one that's come up three times. So I'm gonna start yeah. with that one. And this is a very common question. So we have clay soil, a lot of clay soil in Santa Barbara. So what are some native plants that do better in clay soil? Yeah, I mean, one thing I would do is, is start um, hiking around out here and see what's, what's growing in our native soil. So it's probably gonna be some more of our, our local plants. You know, the oaks do pretty well here. Uh, a couple species of Ceanothus, both Megacarpus and Spinosus do well here. Another thing is, your, this is your yard. And one thing you might want to consider is amending your soil. 
So adding in things like compost, there are lots of soil amendments. Uh, you can even consider adding a little bit of a sandy component or increasing the drainage in that way. So it, it's kind of a question of what is your tolerance for manual labor? Um, you can definitely amend your soil and, and make it really ideal for a ton of plants. Um, if you really want to think about utilizing your native soil, there are a number of plants. I think one place to, to start looking is in the hills around you, what's growing all around you. Um, but, you know, here in the garden, a, a lot of our plants are, are doing pretty well in the clay soils, particularly the chaparral plants. So our ceanothus and our frangulas. Uh, and even one that I didn't mention here, but the Carpinteria California seems to do fairly well in our native soils. Um, so those are some examples uh, right there. Another question is about under oak trees. So you had mentioned oak trees do well in, in clay, but then plantings underneath the oak trees can be tricky. So what do yeah. you recommend for that? Yeah, that dry shade is, uh, is fairly tricky. Um, the hookahs do really well under the oaks. Um, the hummingbird sage does extremely well under the oaks. Um, I think in a lot of ways, those are two of our go-to. Some of the salvias can do pretty well under the oaks as well, or just on the edge of that, um, the shade envelope of the oak. Some of our like salvia leucophila uh, can do pretty well. That's a purple sage uh, in those zones that adjacent to the, the oaks. Um, the Carpinteria does pretty well under the oaks as well. Um, yeah, so that, that's four or so good, good plants to look for in the dry shade. Some of the okay. ribes do pretty well under oaks. The, that Vibernifolium will do all right under oaks as well. We have a question about if any of these plants presented or other native plants may be poisonous to domesticated animals. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I don't. I don't think these are are really problematic that I'm familiar with. That's a good question. Sorry, I'm I'm not 100% certain there. But uh, off the top of my head, I would say these are, you know, we're a dog friendly garden. Uh, we have all of these plants in our garden, and I I've never heard of an issue of of. Um, dogs in particular having issues with the plants that they've encountered. You know, the one thing is they get through poison oak and then get it on their owners. Uh, but that's, that's all I've really heard of. Okay. Um, and are ceanothus plants, are people allergic to ceanothus or is that a different flowering plant possibly? Um, maybe the pollen can bother some people on the ceanothus, uh, but I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with any like skin irritation or anything like that. That might be more of a pollen issue, um, but I, I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's one of the big problematic plants. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, someone's looking for a dense hedge to fit a narrow space. You had talked about the mountain mahogany and can that be pruned and can it also be pruned to maybe attach to a chain link, chain link fence rather than expanding in canopy? Yeah, the mountain mahogany wants to grow up. So if you're looking for more of like a, a box hedge, uh, you might consider something like the lemonade berry. Um, which again, in our courtyard, really narrow planting beds, and it's been doing great for 90 years. And that takes a really hard pruning. Um, you know, we've, we've knocked that thing back every single year and it does great. So if you're, if you're looking for more of an architectural application and, and you really want to shape it, uh, lemonade berry might be a good bet for you. Okay. Um, we've got a question about nursery. So you had mentioned that the garden growers nursery at the uh, Botanic Garden is open. Um, mm -hmm. What are some other areas to get native plants in our area? And the question is also about the LA area. There are lots of nurseries. Um, trying, so we've we've got a Theodore Payne Foundation is a big one. That's I, Sun Valley. Um, there's also uh, who are the ones in in San Juan Capistrano? Uh, is that Tree of Life Nursery is a great one down there in Orange County. Um, man, I, there are tons of them. You know, if you actually go on Calscape, one thing that's really nice about calscape.org is you can search for a plant and it'll actually say available in blank nurseries. 
And then you get a list of nurseries where that plant is uh, available. I don't know how up to date that information is, but that can give you a really great sense of uh, who's been carrying these plants and, and you can give them a call. Down in San Diego, I think there's Musa Creek Nursery as well. Um, who else? I mean, SB natives here, I don't know. I, I think they, I don't know if they grow a retail. Um, that's, that's one of the things they're commercial growers in retail. Um, but I always go to the Botanic Garden um, personally, but there are several others in the region and Calscape's a good resource to find out what uh, native plant nurseries are nearby. Okay. Do manzanitas do well in part shade? What kind of, um, you know, sunlight do manzanitas prefer? I know they you do, showed the Howard McMinn on there. They do best in full sun, uh, but you know, they, they could probably tolerate the part shade. Um, I'd, I'd err more on the side of sun than on shade though. Okay. And we've gotten a few questions about the recording. The recording will be emailed out to everyone. Um, if you specifically want the slides, you can just reply to that email. It'll come from me and I'll, I'll make them available. It's a very large file size. So we're gonna have to figure out how to, how to do that. But the recording you should get most likely on Friday and I'll, I'll email that to everyone who's registered. Um, all right, we get a lot of questions about gophers. So I'm curious, how do you, get, you guys deal with gophers at the garden and do you have any gopher tips for the folks on this Zoom? Uh, vigilance is one thing, uh, you, you know, really with, with this, it's going to be a little bit of a personal decision. Uh, what, what sorts of mechanisms can you tolerate? We, we don't use, uh, chemicals. Uh, we try to use more of an integrated pest management approach. Um, so that can start with a gopher cage. Um, so that would be something that you sink in the ground when you're planting your plant. Um, one consideration with gopher cages is it's tempting to, to want to use like a hardware cloth or something like that. That's very robust, but the, the pore size is pretty small and that can constrict your root growth a little bit. So um, chicken wire is probably the best consideration for a gopher cage. And then um, do consider trapping. Um, I, I know not a lot of people have, have the stomach for that. So it, it is going to be a personal opinion but that's one of the, the joys and frustrations of gardening is that we're going to be, you know, if you're creating habitat, then you're creating habitat and you're going to have some of these pest organisms. So um, you got to deal with them to some degree. And, and sometimes you just have to know we're going to lose some plants. Um, but, you know, thinking about the gopher cages when you're planting, thinking about what your tolerance is for some of the other IPM techniques, including trapping might be. Okay, perfect. I think we just have time for a couple more questions. Um, but Scott's email is on there. And like he said, the Botanic Garden itself is a really great resource to go see some of these plants that we're talking about, talk to the Garden Growers Nursery. Um, there's a question about native succulents. Do mm. you have them? And you know, what do those sort of typically entail? Yeah, so the, the two big groups of native succulents that I'd say, um, particularly if we're thinking about the California floristic province and not really the, the desert areas. So Dudleya is a very diverse genus um, that has a lot of really special plants in California. Um, some of them, a common name is live forever. Some of them are the, the classic sort of crassula sort of uh, rosette look. Some of them are kind of like the lady fingers kind of look. They're all blooming right now. Um, they're really neat. They're, they're really promiscuous plants. So actually, if you're thinking about planting Dudleya, I do recommend looking up if there are native Dudleya populations nearby um, and, and try to be sensitive to planting because if you bring in another species of Dudleya and you have perhaps a rare Dudleya in the open space in your backyard, they might cross pollinate and you might actually be adversely affecting the, the genetics of the native species. So just something to consider, something we've been thinking a lot about lately. And then sedum. There are a couple of species of sedum um, that do pretty well uh, in California. But the Dudleyas are great. Okay, perfect. Um, there's been a lot of questions about other pests. <laughs> so maybe okay. there's a resource you can point them to. We've had questions about rabbits squirrels, skunks, etc. 
Um, you know, is that more of a habitat type of thing well, where it would be maintaining to try to get them to move on? Or is there anything in general about besides the ground dwelling gophers, but um, rabbits, skunks, and squirrel issues? I mean, rabbits in particular, one thing you might want to be careful about is planting a lot of the island plants. So plants whose genetic lineage is most recently on the islands have been isolated for you know tens of thousands of years. And so they've lost a lot of their chemical defenses. And so that's actually an issue we have in our island view garden, which is all island plants. The deer and the rabbits are, are just ravishing it right now. We have to deal with it because we, we have those plants and we want them. So um, really, I think looking towards some of the UC ANR resources of integrated pest management uh, is really gonna be your best bet. So getting into those IPM techniques uh, master gardeners have a ton of resources. They have a hotline that you can call, uh, and they're they're really going to be great experts for you in terms of dealing with some of these specific pests and some of the different methods. Uh, again, it's it's going to be about what is your tolerance for some of these different activities, and it's not uh, a silver bullet. You're probably going to need to apply several different techniques. Um, and that's, that's part of it. If we're creating habitat, um, it's hard for us to, to choose who we're creating habitat for. Uh, and so these are important parts of our ecosystem. And sometimes we need to just tolerate the fact that we have to coexist with animals that, that are um, not doing a great service to our plants, but the plant is doing a great service to them. Uh, and they're contributing to the ecosystem in other ways. All right. Well, thank you, Scott. I think we've covered a lot today. When I send out the recording, I'll send out some of these links to someone posted in the chat too, but IPM, um, the Master Gardener information, uh, the booklet, the Waterwise Native booklet, and the Calscape and Botanic Garden website. So um, more resources to come, but thank you so much for this presentation, Scott. It's been really exciting and we have a lot of great questions. So thank you everyone for being here and I'll send out the recording um, when it's done. All right, thanks everyone. Thank y'all so much.